And welcome to Morgan's Variety Podcast. And today our customer is Barry Brown, author of Humanity, The World Before Religion, War, and Inequality. Barry Brown has been a journalist for about 30 years. He was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. And we're going to talk about his book today. Now, how would you classify the book? Is it a historical book or a sociology book? How, how, would, you disc- how would you classify it? Well, it's basically a history book, although you could say it was also part philosophy. Uh, The book begins by noting the fact that there's no uh, fossil or archaeological evidence uh, showing organized human war before about 6,000 years ago, like none, zero anywhere. So uh, my book is the first, really, to look at history, first ever, really, to look at history as the two-part story of one human family, how we managed to create a common civilization of travel, trade, and language in the first 99.9% of history, and then the first war and how its consequences lead to the modern world. Uh, And through that, I examine the beginnings of things, how we uh, created this culture, you know, how language begins, how we began to trade, uh, how we started to set up, uh, you know, um, settlements and civilizations, and how that all changed over time. You know, there's been a lot of theories about the serpent in the Garden of Eden, how people used to say, well, that's Satan, but the the Old Testament doesn't actually say he's mm-hmm. Satan. You know, in this part of the world, we associate snakes and serpents with, you know, deceitfulness, treachery, and all that kind of stuff. But in ancient China, the snake is a symbol of sagacity and wisdom. Mm-hmm. I can't help but wonder if maybe the snake really symbolizes you know, the atheist, the skeptic, the one who has knowledge of what took place before Eden. Do you think maybe that's what the Bible is trying to tell us? There are a lot of people who have a lot of information that's not mentioned in this book, but just turn a blind eye. And if you are, if you do find yourself a recipient of this information, you'll be corrupted and your soul will be condemned. How do you feel about that? Well, I think you're touching on a number of different topics. So one is, was there a historical event that took place about 6,000 years ago that inspired the story of the Garden of Eden? Um, The other point that you're really asking about is religious doctrine. Uh, And, of course, religion is as... Organized religion is a somewhat more modern uh, invention. You know, one can say that people had a concept of the deity, obviously, long before there was religion. And uh, then thirdly, you're talking about the image of the snake and how, you know, the, what, uh, uh, how, that, how the snake and, and that metaphor has been perceived throughout human history. So let's take the three different points as, the, as three different points. Um, so in my research, um, uh, what I found... Um, so, so my book was inspired initially because I came across this obscure quote from Aristotle who said, the Jewish people are descended from the Brahmin priests of ancient India. Now, I was curious about this because I'm Jewish, and when I was younger, I spent about three years as a Hare Krishna monk studying the ancient texts and language of India, and I was initiated as a Brahmin. So, although I'm not a religious character, I am an investigative reporter. So the first thing I did was look at the Bible to see if there was anything in there that gave this any credibility. So the Bible says human civilization begins with the Garden of Eden story, as you were mentioning. Now, according to the Bible, Eden was an enclosed place in the eastern part of a larger land called Havila, which is in chapter 2 of Genesis. So now my next question was, where was Havila? So Indiana Jones-like, I turn now to the 20-volume 1906 Jewish Encyclopedia, which says that the oldest traditions in Judaism and Christianity, going back more than 2,000 years, all agree that Havila was India. So now I have another question. The Jewish calendar begins about 6,000 years ago. Now, you probably know some fundamentalist Christian types say that the world was created 6,000 years ago, and they get that number from the Hebrew calendar. However, Hebrew tradition doesn't say the calendar begins with the creation of the universe. It says it begins when Adam and Eve leave Eden. Okay, so now we have a new question. If Eden is in India, and Adam and Eve leave this place to start migrating westward, according to the Bible, after some event... What event happened in India 6,000 years ago that might have inspired this story? So what happens in India 6,000 years ago is the world's first war. It's called the Kurukshetra War, and it's the war that ends ancient India's history in the Mahab- in their text called the Mahabharata about 6,000 years ago. So what I began to see was 
the end of ancient India's history 6,000 years ago and the beginning of the Hebrew history 6,000 years ago are basically two halves of the same story. Okay, So the original idea wasn't about two people. And in fact, if you look at the ancient uh, Hebrew words for Adam and Eve, they, they can mean man and woman or men and women. So although it's translated to be two people, it wasn't necessarily in the original text that it meant that there was only two people alive at the time. So these things get you know changed as the stories get passed down and eventually written down. Okay, So, um, so what, what you have here seems to be two halves of the same story. And as we were discussing earlier, I've even found the genetic links that link up the ancient families of India with the what are called the Jewish priests or the Levites uh, that are descended from Aaron and Moses. Okay, all right. So these seem to be two halves of the same story. And basically, the fall of mankind in Eden is about the end of generation Eden, the end of humanity before war. Okay, so that's one. The second question you were talking about was religion itself. So since my book looks at that, and one of the things that is obvious is that. Uh, Organized religion, various kinds of organized religion, come after people already have a concept of God. And since there doesn't seem to be any point in history where somebody says, hey, let's all believe in God, um, one can at least assume that people have had some concept of a deity going back to the earliest uh, days of humanity and even before Homo sapiens, you know, possibly in Neanderthals. And in fact, what's really interesting that I look at in my book when I'm looking at burial ceremonies that humans aren't the only one that do burial ceremonies. Some animals do, you know, like uh, birds, some birds, elephants, and mm -hmm. dogs. And one of the questions that we have to ask, although we can't find an answer, we don't know way to know, but since these animals, like elephants and others, gather their, their comrades together and their families together to mourn the death of someone, okay, and they seem to be doing exactly the same things for the same reasons that we do, do these animals with long memories think that their memories of those who have passed, if they're speaking to them in their heads, do they believe in a soul? Do they think that they also carry on? In other words, is our concept of it something eternal that transcends you know, mortal life only part of human, or, or is it something that actually came with us from, from earlier animals? Because they seem to be behaving in the same way. There's no way to know, but we can look and see that their behavior is the same way. They know that there's the uh, end of a lifetime. They have a concept of time and mortality. They're communicating to others to come and celebrate and mourn the life or whatever they're doing. Um, if they're remembering them, do they think, it, you know, <laughs> that they're coming with them? Okay, so that's that, that section of it. Then you asked about the snake. Now, the interesting thing about the snake, you pointed out, uh, in China, they have a different view of it. Same in India. Mm -hmm. um, Krishna lies on a, on a cobra, and the cobra is considered, as you said, a a symbol of uh, wisdom and, uh, you know, greatness, not, uh, not evil. Um, the idea of the snake, if you look back to cave paintings, and we didn't touch on this, but one of the ways we know is that we know that there's, uh, or one of the pieces of evidence that there was no war before a certain time, okay, is, <clears throat> excuse me, there are things called cave paintings. So these are kind of like the newspapers or Instagram of the prehistoric period, and you can find them from about 40,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, and they, they've been found all over the world, okay? And one thing that you will not find in any of these cave paintings anywhere is an image of human-on-human -human violence, okay? And one would assume if there was some violence, uh, it would be recorded somewhere, but it isn't. Now, along with the images, they also have kind of symbols um, of things that will become letters and other kind of symbolic, uh, you know, communications for ideas. So, for example, the hashtag and the asterisk are both 40,000 years old. They've been around oh. for a long time. And funnily enough, the hashtag, which is used as a, a sort of symbol for gathering of ideas, um, originally means a human settlement. Hmm. Okay, that was used as that. So that idea goes back a very long way. And among these original 26 or 30 symbols that have been found all over the world in these cave paintings uh, is also a serpentine uh, image. So what the serpentine image meant originally to prehistoric people long, long time ago, we don't know. But certainly it, it, you know, it predates any ideas of evil or the devil or whatever else. Uh, in fact, although the character of Satan, Shatan, uh, is mentioned early on in the Hebrew Bible, he's not associated with the devil. The idea of the devil is a fairly recent uh, creation in Christianity, and I go through that in my book. 
the original idea of shatan, which means the accuser, uh, in, in Judaism, in Hebrew thinking, they don't have a hell, they don't have a heaven, uh, and they certainly don't have a devil. Uh, the original way that they understood uh, these forces was like the old cartoon image of a devil and an angel sitting on each shoulder whispering in your ear that you were an independent actor and sometimes you had voices you know that would say to you do this thing or do that thing and your job as a human was to try and weigh and decide between these two voices which way you wanted to choose but it wasn't as if there was a devil it was just somebody encouraging you to act in a selfish way and the whole point of being coming civilized and spiritual was to overcome your, you know, tendency towards greed and selfishness and rise up to become a, a more fully human being. Similar to the concept of the id, the ego, the superego. Kind of like that, yeah. And uh, so, I'm, so I'm assuming you're just talking about the kind of mass, uh, huge mass casualty war uh, incident um, Jane Goodall studied famously our closest genetic ancestors, the chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. And one thing she observed was that from 1974 to 1978, these two communities of chimps were at war with each other, just constantly attacking and scheming and mm -hmm. strategy. Um, and then she say, well, you know, we're the same way, but are we the same way? Or? That's a very good question. Um, so... Uh, there are about 9 million species of life on Earth, and uh, of those, only three go to war, okay? Some ants, some chimpanzees, and some people. And of the three, people are the least warlike, okay? And even among chimps, they're not always going to war. I mean, if you focus and look only at that, yeah. But not all chimps are obviously going to war all the time. Um, war is not constructive in evolution. Evolution is basically based on cooperation. We evolve because different species start working together. And in fact, if you go back to the beginning, organic and inorganic materials um, start you know, combining to find the best way to contain energy and increase their viability. That's why when you look at the Big Bang after the Big Bang, it doesn't all just end up as dust everywhere. The universe organizes itself into all kinds of communities. They form planets, the planets form solar systems, galaxies, and so forth. Everything likes to, you know, uh, combine itself into some sort of community. In fact, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the physicist who just died? Uh, Stephen Hawking. Thank you, yeah. Stephen Hawking. Uh, Stephen Hawking said in one of his last videos on the black hole, uh, he said, everything in the universe, all energy and all matter, has an intrinsic ability to make a yes or no decision. Okay, so think about that. Mm -hmm. He's saying that all particles, so uh, you know, electrons and protons and neutrons and all forms of energy make decisions. Okay, so that means they have some sense of being able to decide one way or the other. Can't be a fixed way of making a decision or nothing would happen. Okay, it's only because they can decide whether to combine or not to combine that you start to have evolution. So, yes, we're right when you said that the war that we were talking about, the 6,000-year-old war, uh, was the first you know, big organized conflict, because certainly there is evidence of uh, human uh, human violence, small and uh, limited uh, forms, uh, in the fossil record and in the archaeological record uh, going back to early humanity. But however, we have to be a little careful about this. A lot of times you'll see articles that talk about early wars or, or violence, you know, 20,000 years ago or 30,000 years ago. The problem is we really don't know why things happen then. We, we have no way of finding out. I mean, maybe they were shooting an arrow with somebody or doing something because they thought it was going to cure them of a disease. Or maybe they were drilling a hole in somebody's head originally for some uh, spiritual purpose or something. You know, we don't know. Okay, we, we, it's, there's no way really to know what the motivation was with a lot of these things. Sometimes you can see stuff. There was a, when I was doing my research, I found there was an article in BBC about a... Um, an exhibit at the uh, British Museum in London talking about the world's first war 15,000 years ago. Uh, but when you look at it, it's a small group of people, two small groups of people, one of whom have some kind of tools or weapons, and the other side doesn't. And in a very short space of time, this one group slaughters the other. Now, in our modern world, nobody would call this a war. This is a crime scene. You know, a bunch of group of thugs come in and kill a bunch of other people for some unknown reason. It's a crime scene. It's not a war. So when you look at the earlier evidence before this, before 6,000 years ago, what you find is crime scenes and things that we don't know why they happened, really. And uh, Noam Chomsky was once talking about how 
uh, we keep getting fed this propaganda line. If you don't stand in front of the, if you don't stand behind the troops, feel free to stand in front of them. And his feeling is this is how they get people to support wars that aren't really defending anyone's freedom. They're benefiting war profiteers, and uh, it really seems like war began began in earnest once we began to form these enormous institutions like governments and corporations and the like. So, do you feel that? That, that keeps war alive, and that's what really uh, created in the first place the, our tendency to create these enormous institutions that have to be uh, financed and uh, have need power to operate? Well, I th personally, I think there's, there's two things that we're looking at here. One is the impact of greed. Okay, so greed is usually behind almost every war. Uh, so some group wants to take something from somebody else uh, by force. You know, it's, it's a criminal enterprise for the most part, unless you're defending against them, which is a different question, really. Um, but then the other thing you're asking about, too, is why we go along with these things, and for example, in the modern world, why we support, um, what are they, like, um, wars by choice, where you don't actually necessarily have to go to war, and why we um, dominate over others and, and commit atrocities and tortures and that sort of thing. Um, one of the most important aspects of human life, and you could argue other forms of life as well, but certainly human life, is we like to be liked by others, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you have a lot of people going around, especially like we do today in the media and the social media, um, that constantly tell people to fear and hate others, um, and that you should be suspicious of others and always, you know, justify uh, the fact that you kill somebody because you're afraid of them instantly, um, this contributes a lot to the social problems because it wasn't always like that. Um, the idea that you should always be afraid is a fairly modern concept. We, I mean, really contemporary more than even modern um, because it used to be the idea was you're supposed to be courageous. We didn't encourage you to always be afraid and to immediately go for a gun or something because you're afraid and everything should be motivated because of your fears. And again, this goes back to the greed of companies that want to sell you the idea of uh, security, which isn't really secure, because they're always telling you there's a flaw in the security, so you have to get more mm -hmm. securities and so forth. Or insurance as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at the at etymology, the history of words, which I do a lot in my book, um, there is no ancient word for fear. Mm -hmm. Okay? So in, in prehistoric times... Um, people didn't think of fear the way we do today. Uh, one, most you know, early peoples weren't afraid of death. You know, they just saw death as being a natural thing, so they weren't always, didn't have a fetish about it, oh, I'm going to die, and everybody's got to be afraid of death and all that sort of thing. Um, they weren't really afraid of animals because, for the most part, animals aren't going to hurt you if you don't hurt them, you know? And they, even though they put, you know, presented in movies and things like you're just walking along innocently and suddenly a tiger jumps you or some animal jumps they don't actually do that unless they've been really abused a lot. Um, they leave you alone if you don't bother them, right? Uh, uh, same thing with disease, you know? I mean, people got sick and they died, but, you know, they weren't afraid of it. Uh, if you look at the early uh, concept of where the word fear evolves from, uh, the earliest concept is more the idea not of fear like I'm afraid of something bad's going to happen to me, but rather the idea of like when you're first, say, diving into a pool, you know, where you have that hesitation and you need to overcome it to gain courage, okay? Or the idea of like the soreness in your muscles when you're first exercising if you haven't exercised. That's not about weakness, that's about building something. So the original concept of fear came from the idea of a step towards courage rather than a step away from courage, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, and today, unfortunately, there's a lot of that, you know, where people are constantly encouraged to be afraid, to be terrified, uh, to think and be, they're being told that it's natural to be afraid of strangers and people who are different and that the world is all, people have always been fighting over resources and space, which is just not true. People shared resources, shared food and stuff over time. That's how we evolved society. I don't know if it's a conspiracy or not, but one thing many people believe is the media deliberately feeds us a diet of fear. And uh, I was wondering, during all your years as a journalist, were you ever told by editors that that's what they want? They want the, the juicy, scandalous news that they're looking for? Or was there 
just a, a, an automatic uh, attraction to it? How, how would you feel if that always worked out? <laughs> well, in, in my particular case, I'm happy to say nobody ever tried to, uh, you know, orient my stories one way or the other, and I, I wouldn't have worked for an organization that did, frankly. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't hear about it occasionally. You know, uh, I know in certain time periods where there was big controversial issues, some uh, newspapers and media would tell their reporters to slant their stories one way or the other. Um, but I think, again, you're looking at two different issues. So one is, you know, when you have organizations that are clearly dedicated to certain kinds of sensationalism, National Enquirer, Fox News, whatever, or, or other ones that are oriented the other way. You know, I mean, uh, in the modern world, we've got, you know, the Trumps and the anti-Trumps, and, you know, the anti-Trumps can be just as sort of, you know, drum-pounding in one area as the anti-Trump, the pro-Trump people, maybe a little bit less, but, you know, it, it, it's become very polarized. Um, but a part of the problem, too, is what people are taught, and they grow up to believe. You know, so again, like I was saying before, you have a lot of people that are taught this is the way history has always been, that we've, you know, always had this suspicion. And, you know, even people who are liberals, you know, think that. Um, but it's not actually true. Or they, they're taught that multiculturalism is abnormal, that people have always segregated into their own groups. That, that's not true. Um, we're, the genetic history shows we're combinations of many people. Uh, in fact, what's interesting when you look at the history, white people don't originally start off in Europe, you know. White people actually migrate to Europe from the Middle East and Southeast Asia, Southwest Asia, where they originally begin. And, you know, we, we look at, uh, tend to look at history as thinking that since we came out of Africa, the original people were always black. But that's probably not true. Um, what probably was happening since we were mixing with everybody from a long time ago and in in the earlier human ancestors... Um, early human babies probably came out more like cat babies than dog babies. Dogs, as we know, you know, tend to be bred according to their breed, so they tend to come out looking a lot just like the parents, right? Whereas cats, because they're not so domesticated, like for example, I have two cats, a brother and a sister, and the brother is uh, completely white, and the sister is black and brown. And and for cats, to have a, a litter with lots of different colors is very natural because there's no restriction on where their parentage is from. So human beings, before we had this sense of division, were probably the same way. You probably had all the different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, what we would today call racial features and so on back in the beginning and, and lots that have died out. Uh, the question was how large a group they were at any time and how they migrated. Some of them died out, some of them were only small in the beginning, and then they became larger later on. So uh, so that's kind of a roundabout way of saying, I think people are misinformed about what human history is actually about. Um, but the problem is they're, they're brought up this way, and they're taught certain things that are clearly false. Yeah, looking at the issue of inequality for a moment, I think people, the dispossessed, the people who have less, they tend to be in a state where they're, they're helpless, they're disempowered, and I think there are certain people like warlords who take advantage of it, and that's where inequality rears its ugly head because then you can convince them to hate the other guy who has more or convince them they're taking from them. And also, we know hierarchies exist in nature. Uh, every pack animal has the alpha male, and they make the decisions. They decide where they're going to live. They get most of the mating privileges, all this kind of stuff. Um, so wasn't it, wasn't it inevitable that inequality would exist when you consider that hierarchies uh, were part of our evolution as well? Well, hierarchies exist in some forms, but not all. You know, it's like the difference, again, between cats and dogs. Um, dogs tend to listen to you automatically. They're sort of easier to train because, as you point out, they're pack animals and they're used to obeying the top dog, uh, mm -hmm. whereas cats are individual uh, critters uh, that don't form so much in packs and tend to act individually. Um, now, sometimes things evolve in different ways, uh, as with people. Uh, but it's not always the case. You know, um, if you look at, the, at human evolution, when we start off as hunter-gatherers, there is no hierarchy. I mean, it's one of the things, going back briefly to the idea of the concept of God and how it begins. In modern religion, people talk about God as being a king, a lawgiver, an avenger of wrongs, and that sort of thing. But as we point out, as I was, we were discussing before, uh, if the concept of God predates you know, organized society. Hunter-gatherers didn't have kings, they didn't have leaders, they certainly had no fixed laws, and they didn't have any wars. So they couldn't have conceptualized God in that way. 
Uh, in fact, what it appears to be from my research is that the way they conceptualize God is a source of knowledge because that's the way they look at everything. Is each thing, you know, has its own what we would call today a DNA defining its individual nature, but what they would see as their distinctive quality. You know, like when you're learning, if you got new institutions, how do you learn? You learn from talking to other people and also from talking to plants and animals and mountains and whatever else. You hear what you think is their response to you in their head, and you imagine them as having their individual characteristics. So hunter-gatherers and early human beings would have taken this notion uh, and then you know, broadened that to the idea that God is about this, whatever their early concept was, this, the deity or the spirit, uh, was about individual knowledge that's in everything, that unites everything, and that brings us towards harmony and friendship. Okay? Uh, so, for example, also, if you go back to something called Gobekli Tepe, I don't know if you're aware of that. It's a structure in Turkey that's uh, 12,000 years old, 6,000 years before the pyram- um, before Stonehenge, 7,000 before the pyramids. Mm-hmm. And unlike Stonehenge, these are very large, you know, multi-ton uh, uh, boulders uh, with stone structures that also are carved with animals and, uh, you know, different images on them. And a lot of these animals aren't local, okay? Now, uh, some of the modern archaeologists tend to call this place the world's oldest a religious temple. It's not. They didn't have organized religions back then, so it couldn't have been. What this was was a prehistoric Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. Okay, This was the world's oldest university where people began to come and share ideas and share technologies and start to begin the concept of a global human civilization. Because by this time we had settled all over the world and uh, they originally they had teachers who would go out and travel, but then there was climate change. People didn't want to pay the teachers anymore, you know, because it was hard times. So afterwards, they start to reverse the paradigm and say, let's bring people to us. So if they create this one area, which is not a settlement, but is like a school where people come and start to share ideas, and you find at this place in time, the genetic evidence shows all kinds of different people are gathering here, and they start to create uh, large-scale agriculture to feed lots of people. Uh, domesticating animals in the same way, doing uh, types of uh, metallurgy. And when they're carving these animals on the pillars, some of these are not local. So why are they bringing animals like crocodiles and alligators from maybe thousands of kilometers away in Egypt over to this place? Certainly it couldn't be a temple. I mean, do they have special seatings for dangerous reptiles? (laughs) Obviously not. Um, But they're bringing them there for show and tell because it's a school. Because in order to carve these things, the, the artist has to see the animals, okay? And they come from a long distance away. So they're, they're bringing things there and they're sharing stuff. So it's not natural necessarily for people to have a hierarchy. In fact, again, if you go back to your biblical questions at the beginning, uh, one of the differences between the Hebrew people of the Bible and the later Israelites is that when people talk about biblical law, they're talking about the laws of Moses, Okay, the earlier people, before the Israelites, the Hebrew people, the Hebrew people had no temples, no religious laws, and no priests, and no hierarchy. And one of the reasons we know this is at the end of Genesis, when you have the story of Joseph who saves Egypt from famine and so forth, and then he beca- you know, he's made like the vice pre- president, basically, of Egypt, yeah? um, and you know, he goes around and he's overseeing the creation of all these temples to the Egyptian gods. There's never a word mentioned anywhere in Genesis, anywhere in the Hebrew histories, where two, where pe- he, the Hebrew people put two stones together to make a temple to the Hebrew God. Why? Everybody loves them there. They're all singing Hava Nagili and bagels and cream cheese, you know. Why aren't they building a temple to the Hebrew God when there are all these temples to the Egyptian gods? The only answer is they don't believe in them because they think they're socially divisive. And if you ask the question, well, why don't they believe in them? Because they come out of the Indus River Valley civilization, which also had no temples, and they had no inequality. Everybody was, it was a radical socialist state, if you will, um, where everybody lived in equal-sized homes. They had no uh, palaces. They have no warriors. They have no uh, priests. And everybody lives equally. Okay, And the reason that they are like that is because they come out of the war civilization, which was divided by what we would today call the caste system. So they had all of these hierarchical divisions, and they saw those as being the cause of the war. Okay, And so at the, in uh, the ancient Indian text called the Bhagavad Gita, which takes this dialogue that takes place just before the beginning of the war, 
uh, Krishna, who is considered a philosopher in the Indus, not a god, uh, Krishna tells his pal Arjuna that the war is caused by all these divisions and you need to give them all up. So I believe that the people who founded the Indus were inspired by Krishna's teachings in that way, and so they create this radically egalitarian society that gets passed down. Now, later it gets superseded by, you know, it falls because of droughts and floods and things, and the hierarchical societies rise up. But a long way to answer your question, I don't think necessarily that hierarchy is a natural thing. It's natural to have leaders occasionally for certain things that you want done. You know, you're asking me questions about my research and my book because I can tell you more than that. I can lead you educationally through my research. But in other things, I would come to you to say, can you show me how to do a podcast better than I can do it at home? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, what, I've been, what I've been told or have heard is that it was slaves who built the pyramids in Egypt. So do, are you, would you say it was more likely that it was a communal effort? Okay. So the whole idea that the slaves built the pyramids, let's, let's take the Exodus story because that's something I look at in my book. Okay, So there's no historical evidence for the Exodus story the way we understand it. The historical record shows that the people who built the pyramids were hired workers who occasionally went on strike for better living conditions. Now, one thing that you can figure too is you know, when the royalty uh, and the aristocracy were having these uh, pyramids built, they imagined them as their final resting place where for eternity they were going to actually live in some sort of spirit form, right? So the last thing they want is angry slaves taking a dump in their eternal home and smelling it up forever, okay? They want people who are happy and content, all right? So they didn't actually do that. So um, uh, in some cases, the early pyramids and the early things, uh, certainly when society was being built, were communal enterprises because people were working for the good of the community at large, okay? Now, when you talk about the Exodus story itself, I'll just briefly touch on that. So the importance of the Exodus story wasn't about slavery. It was never about slavery. Moses never says two words about slavery. And in fact, he makes laws for Hebrew slaves afterwards. What makes the Exodus story historically important, not just biblically important, but historically, is this is the beginning of extremist religious groups. Okay, The first religions that begin to say, um, here's how God should be treated, and if you insult my God by worshiping God in the wrong way, I get to kill you. Because the pagans didn't do that. The early groups, you know, everybody had different ways of understanding God, and it was like being at university. You know, you're taking physics, I'm taking chemistry. I don't think you're going to hell because you're studying atoms in a different way than I am, right? It's just, you know, you're sharing knowledge or different kinds of foodstuffs, that's all. It, you know, it wasn't different because they saw one God and different ways that people understood it. Again, the idea that there were these uh, people who believed in many gods and opposed to people who believed in one God, most of them believed in a single God that manifested in different ways. Not necessarily that there were separate gods per se, you know? Um, okay, so going back to the to the story of Exodus, what you really have here is a story about three religious revolutions, and that's why it's important. So, for example, you know, when you start off with people... Um, the three religious revolutions are one, the pharaoh of Egypt's revolution, and this is Akhenaten against the traditional priest because Akhenaten is imposing his one god religion the Egyptian priests who re- counter revolution against Akhenaten and kill him, and then because there is a plague that comes through Egypt at this time, they blame all the one god worshippers who've rejected the old Egyptian gods uh, for the cause of this plague, and they expel them that's the exodus then the third revolution is Moses and the Israelites against the Hebrews. Because as we were mentioning before, the Hebrews don't have a structure, they don't have a hierarchy, they don't have religious laws, and this is imposed by Moses. So um, you begin to see the Moses revolution as kind of like the reign of terror during the French Revolution. Right? So I can go into more detail, but basically in sum, that's it. And uh, pro- propaganda is a very essential tool of war. Uh, you need personnel, you need weapons, you need billions of dollars of, of taxpayers' money, uh, but you also have to be able to convince them that it, that going to this war is justified. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if there is a war on record that didn't utilize propaganda. So how far back does that practice go of using propaganda to persuade in persuading the people that a war is necessary? Another very good question, <laughs> and something that I address in my book. <clears throat> so uh, I have a, um, something in there from, I think it's Cato the Elder from ancient Rome, this philosopher, statesman, 
And uh, I think it's him, it might be, I'd have to look it up. But at any rate, uh, he talks about the fact, again, that war is not natural. You know, people don't naturally kill other people. And in fact, uh, the studies that they've done, say, in World War II, found that I think it was only 10% of the people actually shot directly at somebody else. I mean, they fired their weapons, but they didn't actually kill someone. Unless somebody's attacking you, it's it's hard for you to kill somebody. That's why even today they find a lot of people with this post-traumatic stress disorders who have to kill people unnecessarily when they're in war zones. It's just not a natural thing. So Cato talks about the idea that... uh, how you would train people to do this by first having them kill animals and then killing animals that served you. you know, So you start to um, condition people and desensitize them to the idea of killing something without a reason just for your own gratification. And, and again, this goes back to what we were talking about before in the hate groups and other um, organizations like that that are isolationist, segregationalist, and uh, you know, uh, elitist. Uh, that constantly have to indoctrinate their fellows um, to hate those who are on the outside and think of them as lesser when they're not. Uh, Because people aren't normally like that. You know, even though there may be uh, inequality in certain things, just because somebody has some more material possessions than you or has a different job, is not necessarily a reason to think of them as inferior or superior. Again, you know, you look at sometimes older movies and you can see that you know, people may have servants, but they treat them with a sense of equality. Yeah. You know, de- depending on the, yeah. the social setting that you, that the story is telling. Uh, and, they, and they treat them like that because they realize how important they are. Uh, in fact, when I was a devotee, one of the things that my spiritual master used to say was that uh, we tend to think of people in a service capacity as being lesser than us. But the servant is actually superior to the master a lot of time because they depend on them. And a, and a good servant is really crucial to the success of what happens. Um, again, we're taught today constantly to look down on other people when that's really not a natural way because everybody's got their function. You know, I mean, uh, your arm may be of less importance to your survival than your heart or your brain, but uh, you wouldn't be happy if I just started cutting off your arms. You know, they, they serve us in an important way. Yeah, I remember as, a, as, as I was a kid being taught you know, like garbage men or losers, the guys who probably didn't graduate from high school. But then we found out in 2003 during the garbage strike here in Toronto just how important these guys are to the function of our city and how uh, the, the, uh, the varmint population exploded and it was very unhygienic for our environment uh, to, to let this strike go on. Yeah. yeah, I remember one time I was listening to the radio with somebody from Amnesty International and they were asked the question... Um, aside from contributing to amnesty, uh, what can we do as individuals to fight against this idea of torture and abuse of people around the world? And the person said, uh, well, uh, one of the things is that when you're encountering service people, to treat them with equality, because the first step to torture and abuse is looking at other people as lesser than you, because you have to look at them that way in order to do these atrocities on them. You can't identify with them, otherwise you wouldn't do it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's coming back to this idea that all life is precious, all life is to be respected. You know, I mean, there's another chapter in my book on laws, um, back of some few hundred years back, not that long ago, but back in like the 1600s, to about the 1700s or so, and a little earlier, uh, in Western society, in Christian society, uh, you couldn't just go and kill even insects, let alone animals, you know, for no particular reason. You had to actually give them a trial. So I have a few examples in there of trials of insects yeah. uh, back in the, you know, a few hundred years ago. So, for example, uh, one trial uh, took place, a crime. These uh, termites were charged with eating away at this unused portion of a monastery. And the monks wanted to kill them, but they couldn't just go and get some poison and, you know, kill a whole bunch of them for no reason. Okay, they had to actually go and get permission from their superiors. And so the termites were given a lawyer... <laughs> Okay. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. They were going to lawyer, and, uh, you know, uh, they, they're, the defense lawyer said, well, um, the monks are just, you know, accusing them of doing something that's their own fault. They let this part of the temple go into, the monastery go into, dis, you know, disrepair, and the termites were just doing, doing what termites do. See, so the, the verdict was that uh, this portion of where the termites were living, the wood, was to be cut out of the structure, taken out into a field so the termites could live there, and then the thing rebuilt 
And after that, the monks were told to keep, uh, keep the upkeep so that there will be no termites come back. So uh, they were treated just like people. They could be accused of different crimes, and they were entitled to a lawyer. Sometimes they were accused of witchcraft and things like that that also people were accused of. But, um, but yeah, they, uh, they respected them in that way. One of the, the most interesting quotes I've read regarding inequality was when Gandhi said, poverty is the worst form of violence. Uh, it didn't elaborate on what he meant specifically. Do you, do you have an idea what he meant by that? Well, you know, putting people in a position where they can't improve their lives if they want to, this is the crime. Uh, the mere fact that there may be wealthier people and not so wealthy people is a normal thing. I mean, you know, people are stronger and faster, better looking or different things. There's, you know, uh, different qualities to different kinds of people and different kinds of life. That's a positive. If we were all the same, nothing would happen. Nothing would change. There wouldn't be any evolution. There wouldn't be any opportunity for creativity. Um, the question is, how do we behave towards each other? You know, I mean, if the uh, it used to be that the people would use their wealth, not all the time, obviously, and not everywhere, but the idea was that you would use your wealth for, you know, building, say, free hospitals for people. Uh, in ancient Rome, they used to think that, uh, you know, a city is not great if they have, you know, uh, unless they have, like, large public baths for everybody, that they used to line with gold and marble and stuff. Um, uh, uh, I can't remember his name, but one, I think Carnegie, I think it was, um, you know, he built a lot of libraries. He, he dedicated all of his wealth when he died to building free public libraries all around North America, including the, I think the Riverdale Library over here and, and several others were built by Carnegie Money. Um, if the wealthy people, you know, were using their wealth in order to help others, we wouldn't need taxes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you wouldn't have to go through the way of taxing people and then trying to avoid taxes and loopholes and then putting it through the government and the government eventually building the, th the social things that were needed. You know, if uh, Loblaws, say, uh, you know, made it a point of whatever there was snow, sending out people, you know, in, in lieu of taxes, cleaning all the streets around their stores, and everybody else did the same thing, the corporations, um, and built the subways and did all of these things, you wouldn't need the taxes. We have the taxes because they're not doing these things on their own. And so we, sh we you know, slough it off to the government, and then they get battles over who pays what and so forth. So in and of itself, it's not the inequality that's the problem, uh, at least to me. It's a matter of how we engage with each other and how much we're contributing to the common good and the commonwealth. I mean, our country used to be called the Commonwealth of Canada. You know, we used to think of it that way because we enjoyed the benefits of commonwealth, that we did things for the common good. It still didn't mean that you could still have people who are you know, wealthier than others, but you did things for the common good. And, and there's, there's, there's an ancient pattern of um, power and wealth accumulating to, towards the top and concentrating on the top to the point where it's like it rings everyone at the lower levels dry and then society falls apart. Do you think there's any possibility of this happening with the kind of income inequality that's happening in the West now with uh, the, what they call the, Plutar the Plutarchy, I think, the Plutocracy yeah. now? Yeah. Uh, what do you think that th this trend is going to lead to that sort of situation like they had in ancient Rome? You mean will we collapse because of it? Yeah. You know, that's a difficult thing to say because uh, one of the things we see is that uh, um, the capitalist system as we have it today, although it's rife with all of these problems, it's got all these structures built in to make sure that it doesn't collapse anymore. Um, one of the things is the way that money is distributed. I mean, the reason that you had a Great Depression in the 1930s is that you had what was called the gold standard. So money had to be linked to some tangible good. If you didn't have enough gold, then you didn't have enough money, and so you couldn't do certain things. Uh, ever since the great, uh, you know, the financial crisis in particular, um, of 2000, uh, you've had what was called, um, what do they call it, uh, like financial easement or something, I can't remember what the phrase is right now, quantitative easing, right? Okay, so this is the idea that they just print the money because <laughs> you've got oh, countries like America. Funny that, money, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, where there are trillions of dollars in debt. They don't care. Nobody ever expects to get paid back from that money. They don't care anymore. They just keep printing the money, and then people use the money to expand their businesses. Same in China. A lot of their stuff, their economy, is not necessarily based on fundamental uh, economic growth, but, you know, printing the money that they have there to give to people for certain work that they do, some of which really is, you know, for pointless things, creating cities that don't really do anything in apartments that are, nobody lives in. But they spread the money out there. 
and so people have money and they can spend. So uh, as long as you have people that have access to money, and then once they buy stuff, like they buy houses, so now they have an asset that they can borrow against, and the borrow rate for money is like 1% or 2%. It's very little. So they can make money by reinvesting it in other things. So the poor people, you know, you and I and other people who don't have a lot of assets can't take advantage of it. And that's why we sit where we are and can't really advance ourselves. But anybody who's already up there is just going to keep growing and keep getting wealthier because they can borrow money at tiny rates or the rest of the people are trapped with, you know, credit cards that charge you 20 percent plus and so forth and uh, never really have a chance to advance. I mean, how can you... Uh, you know, buy an asset like a home when they're like a million dollars a piece now. You know, it's not like the old days where you could buy a house for $20,000. You know? <laughs> well, thank you very much, Barry, for doing this interview. I appreciate it. And uh, so uh, what are all the ways in which people can purchase your book? I, I, it's on Amazon. I saw on Amazon. Where else can they purchase it? Well, mainly on Amazon, but you can, you know, if you ask your local bookstore, they can certainly order it. And uh, I'm starting to do speaking engagements. So if anybody... Uh, you know, is interested in having me speak at their college or university or whatever other group. I'm speaking at, you know, Hindu temples and synagogues and churches and other places about different aspects of my book. Uh, they can get in touch with me through uh, humanitybeforewar.com, which is my website. Uh, they can email me through there, and I can hook them up with my uh, PR lady, and she can uh, book something with you. Um, but, uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Morgan, for having me. I really appreciate uh, being here. Yes, thanks for stopping by.